Great, welcome. Oh yes, we're gonna have a lot of fun and I think we're ready to get started. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. I'm gonna jump on to the camera so you can see me. Hello everybody, welcome to Museum of the Rockies and our live stream program today in partnership with Streamable Learning. My name's Angie Weikert. I work here at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Um, I'm gonna be your host for today's program. So you'll hear me off camera talking to Jordy who I'll introduce you to in just a minute. Before we get started, a couple things to note about the platform that we're using for this program, Zoom. You have two ways to interact with us today. You can use that chat box like we've been using um, to get to know each other. Um, if Jordy asks you a question uh, or if you want to share something, you're welcome to type into that chat box and I'll, I'll read as many responses as I can. If you have a question that you want to ask, go ahead and use the Q&A area of this Zoom platform. The uh, chat box moves pretty quickly with all of us in the room. So if you use that Q&A area, it'll help me make sure we ask Jordy as many questions as possible. Uh, before we get started today, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to Museum of the Rockies. I know um, I've seen in the chat box, some of you have been here before. I'm gonna go ahead and step off the camera so I can get to the computer and I'm gonna show you a few slides of where we're at in the US, um, where Jordy and this exhibit are coming to us from, and then I'll pass it over. So I'm just gonna step off for just a minute. I'm gonna share my screen and we will get started. So here is a map of the US. I know we've got folks tuning in from Florida to Maine to Alabama. So you can find yourself on the map. That red pinpoint is where this exhibit is from, Allenwood, Pennsylvania from Clyde Peeling's Reptiland. Um, the Museum of the Rockies hosts traveling exhibits and we changed those out um, and this exhibit is coming to us from Pennsylvania. Here we are, um, the pinpoints moved now to Bozeman, Montana, which is where the Museum of the Rockies is. We are located just north of Yellowstone National Park in the Gallatin Valley. I know that there's many students tuning in today from all over Montana. Um, so welcome, we're glad you're here. And some of you may recognize this. This is the entrance to our building. Um, and I bet a lot of you could guess what kind of dinosaur that is that greets you. Museum of the Rockies is well known for its paleontology department um, and you are looking at a T-Rex, that is Big Mike. Our grass is not quite that green yet. Um, it's a little bit rainy today here in Bozeman. Um, we're moving into spring, but we're not quite that green. So inside the museum um, is our traveling exhibit, Reptiles, the Beautiful and the Deadly. When we do open back up to the public, we hope you come and see us. We'll have these live animals here through September 13th. Um, and as we learn more about opening dates, we will post those to our website. So we hope that you can come and join us um, once we reopen. Here's a picture of where we're at right now. So this is our opening night um, of the exhibit way back in February. And Jordy and I are coming to you live from this exhibit. Um, we are here because Jordy has an essential job um, to to take care of these animals every day. So um, welcome, we're happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna to talk today about turtles with Jordy. Thanks for being here today, no Jordy. No problem, happy to do it. Okay, so my name is Jordy Hall. I am, you can call me Zookeeper Jordy if you want. I am a zookeeper from Clyde Peeling's Reptiland. Like we said, this is where all these animals come from. And I come in here seven days a week during this entire crazy period of time to take care of these animals. Even when it's not a crazy period of time in American history or world history, I am still coming in here seven days a week in order to take care of these animals. So uh, I'm very well familiar with these animals and they get excellent, excellent care even during this entire uh, crazy time. So we're going to jump right on into it. We're going to today going to be talking about turtles and tortoises. Now I mentioned we have four species if you were here a little bit earlier. I mentioned we have four different species on this exhibit. And before we start talking about the turtles in general, we have to ask the question, what even is a reptile? Now I am confident some of you have seen my previous talks that I've done. So we're going to play a little, a uh, little bit of a quiz. So get your typing fingers ready. So I want to see if you guys know the answers. Now, the top picture, we have our adorable little baby Jackson's chameleon. He is a great example of one of the traits that makes up a reptile. What do we call the things that cover a reptile's skin? If you know, if you have a guess as to what we call the things that cover a reptile's skin, use that chat box. Type it on in there. Fantastic, I see a lot of answers coming in. I'll give you just five more seconds to type your answer. And it is 
scrolling so fast in the chat box, Jordy. A whole bunch of our students saying scales. That's correct. You guys know it. So scales are a protective layer on the top of reptile skin that gives them a lot of protection. Next, if we look on the bottom right corner, we have an adorable baby wood turtle. And trust me, we're going to be talking more about my wood turtles. But well, there we have a baby little wood turtle that is doing something right now. It is being born. Now, the question is here, what does the term oviparous mean? Oviparous, what does it mean? Type that answer in the chat box. All right, use that chat box. What does oviparous mean? Oviparous is a, a big, big word. <laughs> You've got some guesses coming in. Oh, you guys are so fast. Great job, keep guessing. <laughs> I'm gonna give you five more seconds to type it in. We have a whole lot of guesses saying born from an egg, egg laying, egg something. That's exactly egg. it. Oviparous means egg birth. Every reptile is hatched from an egg. The females usually dig a hole, they lay all the eggs, they walk away. There's very little parental care with most reptiles, especially with the turtles and the tortoises. And then finally, on the left-hand picture, we have Guanji, the uh, rhino, or the the Cuban rock iguana, and he is currently sunbathing out on the nice warm sun. So the question here is, what does the term ectothermic mean? In terms of reptiles, what does ectothermic mean? All right, use that chat box. Ooh, some of you are so fast, great job. <laughs> ectothermic, ectothermic, type it on in there. What do you think ectothermic means? I'll give you just five more seconds. I want to give you time to type before I start reading all these answers. We have a whole lot of guesses of cold-blooded. That's exactly it. So cold-blooded. Ecto means external uh, or outside, and thermic means temperature. So these guys are cold-blooded, meaning a reptile is going to be very different from us. We are warm-blooded, endothermic. We are warm-blooded, so we have to eat a lot of food, having to burn a lot of energy, staying a nice warm standard temperature all the time. Reptiles don't have to do that. And because of that, they have a lot of different changes in their uh, their overall uh, uh, existence. For instance, a lot of reptiles eat a lot less. Example, these turtles and tortoises typically are only gonna be eating a few times every week, and that is all they, they need. Because again, they're not burning so much energy. Now, let's go ahead and start talking about turtles and tortoises with our, with we gotta look <laughs> at the reptile family tree. I know the PowerPoint I made. Now, what we have here is a breakdown of the reptile family tree. Now, in previous chats, I talked about the crocodilians and how they're really closely related to birds. We talked about the snakes and how they're really closely related to lizards. I briefly mentioned the very first chat about tuataras, which are a very, very ancient, incredibly endangered and rare reptile that looks like a lizard that is different from a lizard. But again, we're not talking about them, we're talking about turtles. And as you can see, turtles are among some of the oldest reptiles on this planet. Their ancestors go back to way before the age of the dinosaurs. And over millions and millions of years, they became the turtles and tortoises we know now. And turtles and tortoises have been practically unchanged for millions and millions and millions of years. Now, we are uh, um, going to start talking about the actual turtles and tortoises. Now, what is a testudine? Now that is a big formal word. That is the proper term for the order that reptile or that turtles and tortoises fall under. Every sea turtle, every turtle, every tortoise is a testudine. Now it's also really complicated because you may have heard the term testudine, but odds are you've probably also heard of the term uh, colonian or uh, chelonian is sometimes how it's pronounced. If you play some certain video games, there's a cult uh, involving around a great big turtle and they're called the cult of colonia. That's the same kind of thing. So colonia is a general term that scientists use to group all turtles and tortoises together, including the ancient turtles and tortoises. Testidines really only cover the currently living ones, like the ones that we have on this exhibit, not the ancient, ancient, ancient turtles. So that is what a testidine is. Testidines are turtles and tortoises. Now, one of the traits of a turtle and tortoise is typically they have a long neck, even though you probably don't even realize that some of these turtles have long, long necks. Now, all of them do have longer necks. They can, uh, the, 
they all have long necks, and there are two kind of groups of these turtles. And one, you can really tell they have long necks. One I have on the side uh, with me right here. We have our snake neck turtle right here. They are known as a side necked turtle. Their necks are really, really long, but they're incapable of pulling them, their necks into their body, so they have to fold it along the side of their body. So they are a side neck turtle. Then you have the other group of turtles, like what we see behind me with my alligator snapping turtle, whose necks are long, but they're not designed to kind of fold sideways. They're designed to fold upwards into the shell. So even though it doesn't look like a turtle has a long neck, it really does because that spine goes all the way into the shell. So they do have incredibly long necks. A lot of species use these long necks to be able to reach into, get a farther reach of things, uh, maybe even kind of push through the soil. Um, but for the most part, a lot of them use it to be able to tuck their heads into their shell for a lot of extra protection. Now the other trait that makes up a turtle and a tortoise is the shell, as we can see there with that adorable little uh, juvenile uh, yellow-footed tortoise right there, enjoying his two-year-old birthday cake right there. Now, uh, um, uh, the shell is a very big defining trait of all turtles and tortoises. Now we typically, uh, um, uh, most of the time we imagine a shell is being hard and bony and big and tough. And we have, as uh, scientists have a lot of big formal terminology for the shells. For example, this here is the uh, shell of, here I'll get a little bit closer. Here we have the shell of what was a uh, forest tortoise before. This is not the same one you saw in the picture, do not fret. But this is a shell of a forest horse, and you can see the classic thing that makes up a turtle and a tortoise. Now, I'm sure every single one of you have probably seen something uh, out uh, on, say, TV, maybe in a book, in a comic book, who knows where you've seen it, but I'm sure you've all seen something where a tortoise or a turtle can either take off their shell like it's a jacket and hang it up on the wall, or maybe they can tuck themselves into the shell, and inside their shell is a nice little cozy apartment of like a recliner or books or something like that. That is not the case in real life. Turtles and tortoises never ever leave their shells because the shell is part of them. This is live bone. The same thing that helps protect your brain, your, your, uh, your skull made out of bone, same thing with this turtle shell, only protects the whole body of the tortoise. We can even see that if we look on the inside of the shell, you can see the spine is actually fused to the shell right there. And you can also see the hip bones are also connected as well. So a turtle and tortoise never, ever, 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 ever is going to leave their shell unless they're not longer with us. But the point is, turtles and tortoises are part of the shell. Now, like I said, scientists have lots of terms for pretty much everything, especially in biology, and turtle shells are no exception. The top of the shell is always called the carapace. The top of the shell is the carapace. The bottom, like right here, is always called the plastron. Now, here's a fun little, uh, little piece of trivia. I know that this tortoise, even though I never met him when he was alive, I can tell that it was a boy. Now the question is, how can I tell? Well, if you look closely as I turn this, you'll see that the shell is actually concaved. So male tortoises, now this isn't for every single turtle or tortoise, but male tortoises have a concaved shell. That, be, that is, they have that so that way they can get very close to the female in order to successfully mate. But that's how I know this individual was a, uh, uh, was a male. But, um, how did we get that shell? So this shell, the individual was with our zoo a uh, very long time ago, and it died at a nice ripe old age um, of natural causes, and we decided to preserve the shell for educational purposes. So this animal lived a nice, full, healthy life, hence why we have a nice, full, healthy shell, and then when he passed away, we see he's still helping us educate people about uh, turtles and tortoises. So yeah, so the top of the shell is always called the carapace, the bottom is always called the plastron, and they are connected with a bony segment right here called the bridge. Now in this case, in order to get the, uh, the shell perfectly preserved, we did have to cut it in half, but it allows you to see that there is the bridge that connects them. And then finally, what's also really important to know about a turtle shell is that there are segments. Now these segments, every single one of these, is called a scoot. And there's a big misconception that if you look at the scoots of a turtle or a tortoise shell, you might be able to see little growth rings on them, and you can age a tortoise just like you would with, uh, say, a tree. But that's not the case. 
These scoots will grow as the tortoise grows, but tortoises and turtles have a varied rate of growth. If I were to be feed, or uh, uh, let's say in the wild, if a tortoise is gonna be eating a lot of food and being kept really warm, he's gonna have a lot of growth rings because he's gonna grow really, really fast. Whereas if he's not getting a lot of food, maybe he's a little bit cold, a little stressed, he's gonna have smaller growth rings. So a tortoise could, or turtle can easily have somewhere between say one to even five or six growth rings in one single year. So you can't accurately age a tortoise based on those scoots. But again, these segments are called scoots. The top is called the, the carapace and the bottom is called the plastron. And that is what makes up a tortoise shell. They have that that gives them a lot of protection. Now, another really cool thing about the tortoise shell is that a lot of people assume that tortoises just kind of, or turtles, just kind of showed up on this planet with a fully intact shell. And that is not the case because way back millions of years, they had a soft leathery shell, which I believe ties into our next slide. If we go back over to the slide. <laughs> Having technical difficulties, but that's okay. There we go. So there we go. So now we see a juvenile soft shell turtle and a juvenile uh, uh, red eared slider right there. Both of them are turtles. One has a hard bony shell and one has a soft leathery shell. Now I know I said that most turtles are defined by having a hard bony shell, but not all of them do. Soft shell turtles are a great example of an ancient, 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 ancient group of tur uh, turtles that have been around for a very long time. They have still a shell-like shape, but their shell is almost completely soft and leathery and not really all that hard and bony. Now, these two things have a lot of advantages and disadvantages. One, if you have a hard bony shell, it gives you a ton of protection, but it will slow you down when you're trying to swim away from predators. But if you have a soft leathery shell, you are really, really fast, but you're gonna be more exposed to potential attacks from predators as well. So soft shells have advantages and so do hard shells, but a turtle is not defined by having a hard bony shell, it's defined by having that shell shape. Actually, if we were to look at an x-ray of a soft shell turtle, you would still see its ribs are formed into a shell-like shape. Its body in general is all stretched out to be a giant shell. Now, I said millions of years ago, soft shell turtles were pretty much the first kind of turtles that were around. And over millions of years, they did start developing that hard bony shell. And the way they did that was not by starting to develop a shell on the back. Instead, we have evidence to show that they started develop forming shells on the bottom of their bellies first. And that's because way back in millions of years, a lot of turtles were primarily aquatic. And back then, there wasn't a ton of things attacking them from above, so they had a lot of protection from their belly from predators that were going to be coming at them from below. So that is the difference between soft shell turtles and hard shell turtles. They are really one and the same, just one is much more older than the other. Moving on. Now, the next question that I get a lot on these shows is what is the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? Now, we all, like I said, they are part of the same order of the testudines. They're all colonians, but there are differences. Not all turtles are tortoises, but all tortoises are turtles. Because if we were to look at the evolutionary line, we would see that tortoises are actually the descendants of modern day turtles. And they left um, and, and changed over millions of years because of where they live. And these two pictures or three pictures are relatively good examples of showing you the three main groups of turtles. On the left, we have a wonderful sea turtle and sea turtles are purely aquatic. They're only can be found in the water. Now, these guys are amazingly adaptive for life in the water because they no longer have really feet or hands really anymore. Instead, their hands have adapted to become giant paddles that allow them to make it really easy for them to paddle and swim through the water. But in uh, the takeaway from this though, is that if they go on land, they're not gonna be able to walk around all that well. So they are purely aquatic because they've got big old flippers. Then in the middle, we have a yellow belly slider right there, which is an aquatic species of turtle. Now turtles are different from sea turtles because again, going back to their 
feet. If we were to look at the feet of a sea turtle while it's swimming, you would see there are, not a sea turtle, a regular aquatic turtle, like a freshwater turtle, you would see that they have individual toes and claws that are all, uh, uh, all they can move independently, but they have webbing in between. So turtles have webbed toes to allow them to swim on water, but they have independent toes that they can move, so that way they can walk up on land and be able to move around from one body of water to the other. So they are semi-aquatic. Sea turtles are purely aquatic. So the, uh, regular turtles are semi-aquatic. And then finally, you have tortoises with my lovely Zareen there. That's my personal sulcata tortoise. T uh, tortoises are the different, are completely opposite from the uh, sea turtles. They are purely terrestrial, meaning they only spend a lot of time on the land. Because of this, their legs are also a little bit different as well. They do have toes, but they're not really, uh, they're not really going to be able to move them independently. They're kind of fused into one giant foot pad that allows them to hold up their massive, heavy, heavy body. They're only going to be walking on land, so they don't need webbed toes to be able to paddle. They need big, meaty, pillar-like legs to be able to lift up their massive, massive, heavy bodies. So that is the difference between a sea turtle, a turtle, and a tortoise. Sea turtles are aquatic, sem turtles are semi-aquatic, and tortoises are purely terrestrial. <laughs> now, we do have, uh, and, and this is all just touching very lightly on pretty much the incredible level of diversity that we have with turtles and tortoises in this entire world. Now, like I said, you have turtles that are purely aquatic, you have tortoises that are purely terrestrial, but there's so many different shapes and adaptations that all of them have, and even colorations like this eastern box turtle right there that's in this picture. But there is almost three, oh, a little over 350 different species of turtle and tortoise out in the world and a good chunk of them are also endangered. And that is just a shame. Now, there's a lot of species that are doing really, really well. Red ear sliders are a great example. If you're in the uh, southern areas of the United States, you probably see them all the time and you don't think anything of them. They are native there. But if you're, say, in the east coast of the United States, you might see some red ear sliders. And that's not so great because they're critically invasive out there. So red ear sliders are doing well, but other species of turtles, like box turtles, their populations are in decline, as well as, say, wood turtles, you have snake neck turtles, Indian star tortoises, a lot of the turtles and tortoises are in danger because they are slower moving animals, they are very commonly collected for the pet trade, and also very commonly collected for food as well. So they're being overhunted and stressed, and so they are a lot of times threatened. Now, we do have four different species of turtle on this exhibit. I'll talk about them uh, a little bit here. So right here, what we have is a, our Florida softshell turtle that's hanging out. He's just kind of basking under a nice warm sun right now. Like I said uh, before, he has a soft leathery shell. And if you guys come into the exhibit, you'll be able to see even a little bit of that bone structure that, ha that kind of forms the kind of uh, shell-like shape of them. Then we also have the snake neck turtle. Yes, that's right. We have the McCord snake neck turtle. This is a species that's from the Indonesian islands, and they have that long folding snake-like neck. Now, uh, the reason why they have these long folding necks, scientists don't fully understand why, but other than the fact that they are just different from the other turtles, the, they, they fold their necks alongside their bodies instead of vertically into their shells. Then we also have a Indian star tortoise on display as well. Her name is May. She's been with us for quite a while. She is a tortoise. You can see that she has those big, thick, pillar-like legs, as well as a very large, heavy, heavy shell that gives her a ton of protection. Now, the other difference between all of these also is what they eat. May is a tortoise, so she's only really going to want to eat fruits and vegetables and greens. She loves her romaine lettuce. Then we have our softshell turtle and our snake neck turtles that love to eat things like small pieces of fish, even small rodents and such like that. And then finally, we have our alligator snapping turtle that we have right behind me over here, which in a just a moment, I'm going to go back and actually feed him one of his favorite food, which is a rodent. So I'm gonna go back there, feed him off. Hopefully you guys can see him really closely and then I'll come back and we can answer some questions, unless we have some questions right now. Yeah, um, quantity. So you said the kinds of food that these turtles, the four species we have yes. eat, can you tell us how much? Good question. Um, so it really depends on uh, each one. So say uh, the, uh, the, the snapping turtle right behind me, he eats one food item, 
once a week, and that's all he needs, but he gets large food items. The snake neck turtle behind me eats three times a week, and he's a very active, uh, agile uh, animal that needs a lot of food to eat. And then we also have the Florida softshell turtle, which also eats three times a week. And May is the only one that eats every single day, and that's because she's old, but she's also a tortoise, and tortoises are typically grazers, and grazers need to eat every single day. She's pretty much like a tiny little cow with that's made out of a helmet. She loves to eat every single day, and she needs to eat every single day to stay nice and healthy. So with that, yeah. I will run back. I will feed off this nappy turtle, and I'll be right back. That sounds great. So Jordy's going to go behind this display, and we're going to move the camera so that you all can see. What do you think he's going to feed the snapping turtle? Uh, and can you see the snapping turtle? Do you see it's kind of camouflaged? our camera adjusts, you should be able to see that snapping turtle there. Mm, good guesses. I see some coming in. Oh, there we go. Nice. Now you can see that turtle. Let's keep up with it here. There we go. Did you all catch that? Turtle still got that rat in its mouth. It's a rat, correct? Yes. Great. Now, while he's eating, I'll share some facts about alligator snapping turtles because, well, they say in zookeeping that you're not supposed to have favorites, but I, snapping turtles are probably one of my favorite animals on this exhibit and snapping turtles in general. So there are quick, fast facts about snapping turtles here. One, there are two species of snapping turtle in the United States. You have the alligator snapping turtle and the, the common snapping turtle. The alligator snapping turtles are you're really only going to find in the south, while uh, uh, common snapping turtles you're going to find pretty much over the entire area. Common snapping turtles also don't get quite as big as alligator snapping turtles. They do get pretty big, close to about, uh, say, 60 to 80 pounds, whereas alligator snapping turtles can get up to 200 pounds heavy. Uh, alligator snapping turtles can also live an incredibly long time as well. They can live to be somewhere around uh, typically about 70 to 80 years old, but there are some individuals that have been recorded to living potentially over 100 years old. So they are a very long lived. They're also a very prehistoric looking uh, animal. They are not related to the alligator at all. They simply are called that because they have a very bumpy shell, almost kind of like the back of an alligator. Um, and uh, also while you're seeing him eat, you can also see that they do kind of chew their food, but not in the same way that we do, where we have to chew our food to make it easier to swallow. They kind of do a similar kind of thing, more breaking up the bones, but they're still going to eat their food mostly whole. They're, uh, uh, they also don't have any teeth to do any crushing. Instead, they have beaks, the kind of like birds that are designed to slice and tear instead. Um, alligator snapping turtles do have incredibly nasty bites. They could do some very severe damage, but that's only when they're on land, just like with common snapping turtles. These guys are adapted to only be in the water. They almost never want to come out on land. So when you find a turtle uh, or a snapping turtle and it's really angry and snapping at you, just leave it alone because it's it's like on another planet to it. It doesn't want to be out in the land section for too long. It wants to go back in the water. It doesn't want to be messed with. When you do come across snapping turtles in the in the wild, though, I've personally been in ponds where there are snapping turtles, and I've accidentally stepped on them, and I still have my foot. And that's because these guys want to pretend they're giant rocks when they're under the water. They want to sit in one place and wait for food to come to them. So if you're walking around, you step on one, they're just going to pretend that they're a rock. Maybe they'll scurry away, but they're not going to attack you. They're not evil animals. No reptile is evil. Some of them are just misunderstood. Another cool adaptation of alligator snapping turtles is, uh, now he's not really showing it off all that well. He's still in, uh, enjoying his meal. But if we were to look inside the mouth of an alligator snapping turtle, they have a little, little appendage inside their mouth that kind of looks like a worm, and it's connected to their tongue, and they can twitch it over and over again, making it look just like a worm. Again, these guys want to sit on the bottom of the water with their mouths wide open, waiting for fish to swim, swim close to them. And with that little worm lure in their mouth, fish swim straight into their mouth, they snap down, they chomp, and then they get their food. So they don't even have to work all that hard. 
This is also why the snapping turtle especially loves being on an exhibit. Now, a lot of people may have concerns that some of these turtles are kept in too small of enclosures. And with that, these guys, that's not really the case. A lot of them are gonna spend a lot of time in smaller bodies of water. And in case of snapping turtles especially, they're gonna choose one really good spot for fishing and that's all they're gonna do. And in a zoo setting like this, they love it here because they always get to sit in the same place. They don't have to worry about predators or nobody bothering them and food always comes to them. So, like I said, these animals are very, very well taken care of. So if he's done, now finally done eating his meal, I'll be happy to take some questions if we have any. We have lots of great questions. <laughs> um, we, you talked a little bit about turtles' ages. Yes. Can you um, describe how we know their ages? I think you talked something about their shell. So the shell is a misconception that you can age the tortoise. Most of the time when we're trying to age a tortoise or a, a turtle or a, a tortoise or anything like that, a lot of times we just have to, I've got to get closer yeah. <laughs> with the light. Great. Okay, so a lot of times we have to, the only way we can know the age of a turtle or a tortoise is really to know its own history. Now, in some species, there are ways of telling. Like, obviously, you can tell the difference between a turtle that is freshly hatched and a turtle that is very old. Some turtles, though, do, do have signs of aging. Going back to my favorite turtle, other than the snapping turtle, the wood turtles are one of my particular favorites. Juvenile wood turtles, as we saw with that picture about the, with it hatching, hatch out as being very dull and dark in coloration. The older they get, the more and more orange their arms and their necks become. So the more coloration they have, the older that they are. So that's one way we can age the tortoises and turtles, but really it's hard to do for the most part. A lot of the times it's guessing game. Now in the case with the animals on this exhibit, they've all been born in captivity, so we know exactly when they were born, so we can know for sure when their ages are. Fantastic. Um, what's the size range on turtles and tortoises? How, how small to how big? Good question. Um, so it depends on the species. Uh, let's say, for example, one of the smaller species of turtle out there is the Asian leaf turtle, and they only get to be about maybe that big. Whereas the largest turtle currently alive is kind of debated, depends on your answer, but one of the largest ones is the leatherback sea turtle that can get to be, I believe it's almost a ton. It's a giant, 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 giant sea turtle of a carapace that's like eight feet long or something. Um, I'm not super familiar with sea turtles, but they are, they do get really, really big. Now, as far as turtles and tortoises, uh, tortoises, there are, uh, the large tortoises are either the Galapagos tortoises or the Aldabra tortoises. There is still some debate among which one gets large, larger, and they can each get to be about somewhere around 400 to 600 pounds heavy. So they get very, very large. But again, the uh, snapping turtles are also some of the largest as well. The alligator snapping turtles uh, come in, are the largest freshwater turtles. But again, some turtle species are very, very small. On average, you're probably looking at most turtles, uh, aquatic turtles are only going to be maybe somewhere between a foot to two feet long. New aim, bigger than that, it becomes much more tiresome to move their body. Um, so you only see the larger ones with more of the, uh, the ones that live a more sentiment, or uh, uh, not sentiment, uh, a more stationary lifestyle. So turtles and tortoises, you describe the difference. Is there a good way, could you say that one more time what the difference between the two is? Absolutely. Is there a good way to remember that? Yes. So. Um, the best way to remember that is look at the legs. Now, uh, now I'm very lightly going over everything that's different. There's a lot of very complicated stuff in between, but the legs are the big thing you can tell the difference. Um, a turtle, you're going to be able to see individual toes with individual claws that are all going to be able to be kind of moved around and kind of moved independently. A tortoise, you're only going to see individual claws, not necessarily individual toes, and they're going to look like a big, thick, uh, foot. So I guess the best way to tell is, does the animal have toes? Then it's probably a turtle. Does the animal not really have clear toes? And it looks, their feet look more like that of an elephant or a rhino or a hippo? Then it's more than likely a tortoise. Great. Um, how about, well, let's talk about the, the snapping turtle that okay. you just fed. Can you tell us um, uh, if it holds its breath underwater? Yes, so all turtles are capable of holding their breath, or all aquatic or semi-aquatic turtles are capable of holding their breath. It depends on how big they are um, uh, in reference to how large their lungs are. It also depends on what temperature the water is or at what temperature in the environment is and what they've been doing. So in the case of snapping turtles right here, they can definitely hold their breath for somewhere around an hour or two. Um, other smaller species of turtles can really only hold their breath for about maybe 30 to 40 minutes. 
Um, but again, if the water is very cold and they're going through kind of like a hibernative state, they're going to be able to hold their their hold their breath for a very, very, very long time. But for overall, it's roughly about an hour to two hours a turtle can hold their breath. So that rat that you fed it was not alive. No. How would that turtle catch its prey in the wild? So in the wild, it's just like what I was saying with the um, uh, the flexible little lure that's in their mouth. They sit. They leave their mouth wide open and something swims right into it. Now, in cases with snapping turtles, um, they will hunt their prey actively on occasion, but it's not a lot. If a fish is giving a, a turtle quite a bit of a chase, he's going to give up very quickly. They're not the brightest animals in the world, and if it's not in their vision, they're probably not going to remember that there was food there. So yeah, so a lot of, especially snapping turtles, they sit with their mouths open and wait for a fish to swim straight on in, and then they eat their prey. Right. So what eats turtles? Pretty much everything is going to want to eat turtles. Um, when they are very small hatchlings, lots of things like to eat them. Birds, mammals, reptiles, other turtles even. They're not that picky. There's no parental care. I'm sure we've all seen the videos or documentaries about the sea turtles uh, all hatching and having to do the dangerous journey to the ocean. That's the same for every single turtle, just not quite as visually dramatic. A lot of turtles will be uh, will lay their eggs in very nested, uh, protected areas, so the babies will hatch out, but they're still at risk of being hunted out by things like raccoons, possums, and such like that. Now, when they get older, there are less and less predators that are going to attack them, like snapping turtles really don't have much of a natural predator when they get full grown. Um, but other uh, turtle species will, uh, turtles and tortoises will be predated on. There are species of tortoise in Africa where there are species of birds that know how to pick them up, fly them in the air, and drop them to bust open the shell to get at them. And that is the biggest thing that prevents a lot of predators from getting them, is that hard bony shell. The younger the individual, the more softer its shell is going to be, and the less protection that shell is going to give them. So pretty much everything wants to eat them um, until it just becomes too difficult to even try to eat them. We have so many great questions. We're going to ask just a couple more here because okay. we're running out of time. Yes. But I'm going to put two of them together. Do okay. turtles have teeth and ears? Turtles do not have teeth. Instead, they have a keratin beak, very similar to that of birds, only it's more designed for slicing than anything else. And they do have ears. They are capable of hearing pretty well. Now, it's not the best, but in the water, they can hear pretty, really, uh, really well because sound travels a little bit better in water. Um, but yeah, so they uh, they do have ears. They are fully capable of hearing. Um, so some tortoises will actually communicate to each other through grunts and groans and such like that. Those are typically going to see with the tortoises but yes they do have ears but they do not have teeth great um the last question is a good one to wrap up on okay. we just talked about turtles and tortoises today but we're in an exhibit full of reptiles yes. can you tell us what else is in this exhibit so also in this exhibit we have pretty much a little bit of every reptile on here except for the two ataras unfortunately but we have some crocodilians one about six feet long uh we have some snakes some venomous some large some small some harmless um we have some lizards some that can climb up walls some that can uh um uh, so, some of them that are very large, run one that's about four feet long. So we have quite a diversity of animals that are on this exhibit, or reptiles that we have on this exhibit. Fantastic. I'm going to wrap us up here. I'm going to share this screen so you can see. Um, we are so happy that you could join us today um, from the Museum of the Rockies. We have upcoming programs. We hope you had a great time. We've got a program tomorrow already for our Fossil Friday. Uh, we're gonna be talking about primate evolution. It's geared towards a little bit older of an age group. Uh, but our Fossil Friday programs will run all the way through the end of May and the age range for those varies. So go ahead and visit museumoftherockies.org slash learn. Uh, to see our full lineup of programming and pre-recorded videos from other uh, programs that you may have already missed. So thanks so much for joining us. A big thank you to Jordy and to Clyde Keeling's Reptiland. Happy to do it. Uh, we hope you can come and join us when the Museum of the Rockies reopens to the public. Take a look on our website for details, um, and we will see you maybe tomorrow or in the future for future live stream programs with Streamable Learning. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody.